Hey guys, it's me, Professor D, and if you're new, welcome to my channel. If you haven't done so already, please press that like and subscribe button below. On this video, I want to cover infection prevention and control, so let's just jump into the questions. First question, the nurse is observing the new staff member work with the client. Of the following activities, which one has the greatest possibility of contributing to a nosocomial infection and requires correction? One, washing hands before applying a dressing. Two, taping a plastic bag to the bed for tissue disposal. Three, placing a Foley catheter on the bed when transferring a client. C, using alcohol to cleanse the skin before starting an IV line. I'll give you guys a moment to think about your answer. And the correct answer is C, placing a Foley catheter uh, bag on the bed when transferring a client. So guys, nosocomial infection, this is an infection that a patient gets from the facility, okay? And the number one causes of nosocomial infections in facilities are catheters, urinary catheters, and that's why it's a strict policy. Patients do not get catheters unless they absolutely have to. And the moment that that patient is stable enough, they're safe enough that they don't need that catheter anymore, we pull it out because it's so easy for a patient to get a catheter. So here's the problem with the answer, um, with the third choice, putting the bag on the bed. Well, that bag is supposed to be below the bladder. When it's not below the bladder, what happens is you get retrograde flow. And so that bag that was already, uh, the urine that was already in the bag flows back into the bladder along with what? Bacteria, because bacteria likes to do what? Ascend, likes to climb up, okay? So our next question, droplet precautions will be instituted for the client admitted to the infectious disease unit with one, streptococcal pharyngitis, two, herpes simplex, three, pertussis, or four, measles. And I'll give you a moment to think about your answer. Okay, guys, the correct answer is streptococcal pharyngitis. Okay, don't forget droplet precautions are um, any droplets that you, excuse me, you put a patient on droplet precautions when the droplets will be five micrometers or greater, right? Streptococcal pharyngitis, those, micro, um, those droplets will be uh, five micrometers or greater. So that patient will be on droplet precautions, but herpes, pertussis, measles, all of those are airborne precautions. And guys, this is on uh, NCLEX, it's on HESI, it's on ATI. You do have to know what's droplet versus what's airborne, okay? Um, let's do the next question. In a small rural hospital, they work with a wide variety of clients. Of this afternoon clients admitted, the nurse acknowledges that the client with the highest susceptibility to infection is an individual with one, burns, two, diabetes, three, emphysema, or four, peripheral vascular disease. And I'll give you a moment to think about your answer. The correct answer is one infection. Let me tell you something. When the patient has a burn, two, uh, well, three, three of your biggest priorities, okay? Your one biggest priority, if that patient had a burn and they inhaled the, the smoke, the, the, um, those noxious fumes, we're worried about airway, okay? Because those noxious fumes will literally cause their, clo their, their throat to close up, to swell up, and then now the patient has no airway, they can't breathe. So that's our one uh, biggest concern, okay? After that is infection. Patients with burns are at great, 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 great risk for infection. Why? Because remember, the patient's skin is a barrier. It's a barrier from microorganisms. And now that they've been burned, the skin's open, it's a perfect environment, it creates a medium for bacteria to settle and grow. And three is dehydration. So when you guys think about burns, I want you to think about airway, infection, and dehydration. And reason dehydration, there's a huge fluid shift uh, make sure you guys watch my video on burns. I go over why that patient is at high risk for dehydration and the nursing interventions for that, okay? Next question. 
Surgical aseptic techniques are employed by a nurse when one, inserting an IV catheter, two, placing soiled linen in moisture resistant bags, three, disposing of syringes in puncture proof containers, or four, washing hands before changing a dressing. And the correct answer is one, inserting an IV catheter. Why surgical aseptic technique? Because this is an invasive procedure, okay? Anything that is invasive, that is puncturing the skin to go into the body, anything that is going into the body, there is a high, high risk for introducing bacteria, for introducing microorganisms, and you must use aseptic technique. Next question. A nurse is changing the dressing and accidentally drops the packing into the client's abdomen. The client has a large, deep abdomen incision that's packed with sterile half-inch packing and covered with a dry 4x4 gauze. The nurse should, one, add alcohol to the packing and insert it into the incision. Two, throw the packing away and prepare a new one. Three, pick up the packing with sterile forceps and gently place it into the incision. Or four, rinse the packing with sterile water, put the packing into the incision with sterile gloves, and I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is two, throw the packing away and prepare a new one. Why? Because this technique is no longer sterile because it fell on the patient's abdomen that's full of what? Bacteria and germs. Remember when you're doing sterile technique, you know, don't forget the rules, guys. Anything below the waist is not sterile. Anything that you turn your back to is no longer sterile. Anything that gets wet is no longer sterile. So don't forget all of your um, all of your rules um, that you learned about sterility. Remember that one inch border um, when you're opening the package, not sterile, right? Next question. Client has a viral infection. Which of the following is typical of the illness stage of the course of her infection? One, there are no longer any acute symptoms. Two, an oral temperature reveals a febrile state. Three, the client was first exposed to infection two days ago, but has no symptoms. Four, the client feels sick, but is able to continue her normal activities. And the correct answer is two. A uh, typical symptom that you will see with infection is fever. You'll see fever 100.5 or higher. You'll see redness, you see inflammation. If it's a draining wound, it may be purulent, foul odor. So those are a lot of those signs and symptoms of infection that you may see. Next question. The nurse recognizes that the special care must be taken in the handling of which of the following to prevent the transmission of hepatitis A. One, blood. Two, feces. Three, saliva. Four, vaginal secretions. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is two, feces. Um, you guys must know those um, sources for Hep A versus Hep B versus Hep C. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with that, make sure that you guys watch my a video on hepatitis. I go over the differences and how the patients can get it. But for this question, we're talking about hepatitis A and the correct answer is two feces. All right, I know you guys wanted to run to number one, blood, you're thinking blood born, but blood, that's hepatitis B. Okay, blood is hepatitis B, and the other two choices of saliva and vaginal secretions, eh, no. Okay, you don't have hepatitis by those two, all right? So next question. The parent of a preschool child asks the nurse how chicken pox, varicella zoster, is transmitted. The nurse identifies that the virus is one, carried by a vector organism, two, carried through the air in droplets after sneezing or coughing, three, transmitted through person-to-person -person contact, or four, acquired through contact with contaminated objects. And the correct answer is two, 
carried through uh, the air in droplets after sneezing and coughing. And that's why patients who are even suspected of having chicken pox or varicella, they have to go on droplet precautions. And I know a lot of these students like to choose three person to person contact because you're thinking chicken pox, you're thinking of all these lesions on the skin. And I want to clarify something for you. Patients with chicken pox, until the lesions are scabbed over, yes, they are contagious. However, the, the way that uh, they're contagious, contagious, excuse me, are through droplets. And that's why the patient has to be on droplet precautions. So I wanna make sure you guys don't get um, tricked by a question, okay? If you see varicella sauce or you see chicken pox, it's droplet precautions. Next question. While working with clients in the post-op period, the nurse is very alert to the results of the lab test. Which one of the following results is indicative of an infectious process? One, iron of 80. Two, neutrophil 65%. Three, WBCs of 18. Four, ESR of 15. And the correct answer is three WBCs of 18 or 18,000, I should say. So guys, you have to know your ranges, okay? Your normal WBC is five to 10. Anything more than 10, that's a problem. That's indicative of infection, right? And anything less than five, that's also a problem because remember WBCs are our fighter cells. That's what fights off infection. So when we see that a patient has a lot of fighter cells, we're like, okay, there's an infection going on. That's why the WBCs have gone so high because they have to fight off the infection. But when the WBCs are low, what does that mean? That means that patient's immunocompromised because they don't have enough of those fighter cells to fight off the infection. So it's very important. You absolutely must know your WBC range, which is five to 10. Anything more than 10, it means infection. And anything less than five, it means that that patient's immunocompromised. Next question. In preventing and controlling the transmission of infections, the single most important technique is one, hand hygiene, two, the use of disposable gloves, three, the use of isolation precautions, or four, sterilization of equipment. And the correct answer, I think this one's an easy one, right? Hand hygiene, hand hygiene, washing the hands. As easy as that is, guys, that is the number one way that we can prevent infections from washing our hands. Whenever you get a choice of washing your hands with soap and water, with using a hand sanitizer or an alcohol-based rubs, based rub, excuse me, always choose washing hands with soap and water. That's always the first choice, okay? And you wanna do that before and after contact with every single patient. Next question, a client with active tuberculosis is admitted to the medical center. The nurse recognizes that admission of this client to the unit will require the implementation by the staff of one, airborne precaution, two, droplet precaution, three, contact precaution, or four, reverse isolation. And the correct answer is airborne precaution. Why? TB, those um, droplets are teeny, 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 tiny, very, very uh, small. So they are less than five micrometers. And that's why when it comes to TB, the patient will be on airborne versus droplet, because remember droplets are more than five micrometers, but airborne is less than five. And TB happens to be one of those droplets that are less than five. So the patient's on airborne and not droplet precautions. An older client may react differently to infectious processes and a nurse suspects that her older client may be experiencing hypostatic pneumonia. The nurse must be alert to atypical signs and symptoms such as one, hypotension, two, confusion, three, erythema, or four, chills. And the correct answer is two, confusion. When it comes to the older adult, 
they typically manifest signs and symptoms of infection very differently than you know the normal average person the normal average person they get an infection what you see you see that their temperature goes up you see that they have a fever you see those typical manifestations but with the older adult what happens is one of the things is because they're older their body temperature tends to already be lower than the regular, just a normal average person, right? So by the time we see a fever in a geriatric person, they might be severely ill, okay? So when the patient's very, very old, when it's a, uh, a geriatric patient, we may not necessarily see a high temperature, okay? Guess what? When it comes to geriatric population, one of the earliest signs and symptoms that we will see is a change in the level of consciousness. What does that mean? That means that that patient has always been awake, alert, oriented. They were with it. Now all of a sudden they think they see their grandma walking down the halls. The very first thing that needs to go to your mind is infection. Because in the elderly, the first sign and symptom of infection is usually confusion. Okay, you'll see confusion. They might manifest other symptoms such as agitation. You know, they used to be very nice and mild mannered and now all of a sudden they're threatening to kill you, right? That's a change in their level of consciousness. That's a change um, um, in their cognitive status, all right? They might be incontinent where they weren't incontinent before. So confusion, agitation, incontinence, those are signs and symptoms of infection in an older adult that you may not typically see in a normal um, lay person. Next question, what is the correct order for a nursing assistant for putting on PPE when caring for a client in isolation? One, wash hands, apply mask and eyewear, put on gown, then apply gloves. Two, apply mask and eyewear, put on gown, wash hands, then apply gloves. Three, Wash your hands, put on gown, apply the mask and eyewear, then apply gloves. Four, put on gown, apply the mask and eyewear, wash hands, then apply gloves. So guys, as nursing students, automatically, you should have gotten rid of two and four. Why? They didn't start with washing hands. The first thing you do is wash your hands, right? So automatically you should have gotten rid of two and you should have gotten rid of four. And that should have left, left you with number one and number three. And the correct answer is number one. So patients in isolation, when you're putting on PPE, you're gonna wash your hands. You're gonna go from top to bottom. You're gonna wash your hands, put on your mask and your eyewear, then your gown, and then apply gloves last, right? And just so you know, guys, because this question is all over the place, it's on HESI, it's on NCLEX, it's on ATI. When you're taking off your PPE, it's the exact opposite. The very first thing you want to do is take off your gloves. And it makes sense because I want you to think about it. Whatever you're doing, maybe you're dealing with a wound, right? So by the time you get out of that room and you're, take, you're taking off um, all of your PPE, your gloves are gonna be soiled, right? So are you gonna to want to take off your gown with the, the blood or whatever you have on your, your, your gloves? Do you wanna reach behind your gown to pull the strings and now you got the blood or feces or stool or whatever it is in your hair and on your clothes? No. So the first thing you're gonna do is take off the gloves so that your hands are clean to move everything else. So. Um, the order that you put on your PPE when you're taking it off is the exact opposite, okay? A client has, requires a, excuse me, a client requires mid-abdominal surgical incision, which necessitates a sterile dressing. An appropriate intervention for the nurse to implement in maintaining sterile asepsis is to one, put sterile gloves on before opening sterile packages, Two, discard packages that may have been in contact with the area below the waist. Three, place the cap of the sterile solution well within the sterile field. Four, place sterile items on the very edge of the sterile drape. And you guys should know the answer because I gave it to you a couple questions ago. 
So the correct answer is to discard packages that may have been in contact with the area below the waist. Why? Like I said before, anything below the waist is no longer sterile. Guys, I'm sorry, I had a little bit of technical difficulty. So I wanna to explain to you why the other choices are incorrect. Number one, where it says, put the sterile gloves on before opening packages. That's absolutely wrong, okay? Matter of fact, the sterile gloves gonna be inside of that package, right? You just gotta make sure that your hands are clean, okay? Um, you, you could put on regular clean gloves and you open up the package and inside there you can get your sterile gloves okay you don't need sterile gloves to open up the package your sterile gloves going to be inside of the package number three place the cap of the sterile solution well within the field well if you guys recall a couple questions ago i told you anything that's wet is not sterile so no way do you want to put that cap well within the field of this um of the sterile area, because if you get that wet, it's not sterile anymore. So you wanna keep that away. As a matter of fact, you wanna keep that cap on the top. And number three, uh, place sterile items on the very edge of the sterile drape. As I told you a few questions ago, absolutely not. Because remember, that one inch border around the drape is what? not sterile so you don't want you don't want it to be anywhere near there because that area right there is not sterile and if you touch it you have to start all over again a client's found to have a bacterial infection of e coli the nurse recognizes the effects of this bacterium anticipates that the client will demonstrate one diarrhea two coughing three cold sores around the mouth or four discharge around the eyes and the correct answer is diarrhea. E. coli, guys, this is a bacteria that's mostly found in feces, okay? And when people get E. coli um, um, infections, E. coli infections cause diarrhea and they cause urinary tract infections. And let me explain why, okay? Like I said, E. coli is normally found where? in the feces. So what happens if someone went and used a restroom, if it was a restaurant worker, they didn't wash their hands correctly, and then they prepared your food, that E. coli got into your food, it will cause a patient to have diarrhea. Here's how it can cause a patient to have UTI. Remember what I said, E. coli is found where? In the stool, in the feces. And that's why women are taught to wipe front to back, because if they wipe back to front, they might accidentally push that uh, stool that was on um, the, the anal area up towards the vagina. And guess what? The E. coli that's found where? In the stool will climb up into the vagina, up the bladder, and give the patient a urinary tract infection, okay? So the correct answer is diarrhea. Which of the following clients is at greatest risk for acquiring an infection? One, a 56-year-old with urinary catheter two days after a prostatectomy. Two, a 27-year-old diagnosed with HIV. Three, a 43-year-old who's three days post-apodectomy and currently a febrile. Four, a 16-year-old with compound fractured femur as a result of a bike accident. And the correct answer is for a 16 year old with a compound fractured femur. And I know what you're thinking because as a student, I know you guys saw infection and you just wanted to jump to HIV because you know patients who are HIV positive are immunocompromised. As a nursing student, you're absolutely correct. They're immunocompromised and that should have been one of your choices. However, look at four. You know what compound fracture is? A compound fracture is what's known as an open fracture. An open fracture is when that bone that's broken pierces through the skin, okay? You can have a closed fracture, an open fracture. A closed fracture is when the bone's broken, but the skin's not open, right? But an open fracture is when the bone's broken and it pierces through the skin. Whenever, and I just talked to you guys about this a couple questions ago, whenever the integrity of the skin is damaged, right? When it's compromised, that's a perfect environment, a perfect medium for what to happen for bacteria to get in, set in and grow, right? This patient was riding their bike, fell and they obviously got a compound fracture. Okay. So now they got their bone protruding through the skin. So that's a perfect environment for that bacteria to grow. They're going to be more at risk to get an infection. A nurse is caring for a client who has colonized MRSA. 
Which of the following statements reflects the best understanding of the client's condition? One, the client has bacteria present, but it hasn't become infected. Two, this makes the client's MRSA very infectious and so a danger to others. Three, just be sure to follow standard precautions and there won't be a problem. Four, the client needs to be watched closely for a conversion of, excuse me, for conversion to active MRSA. And the correct answer is one, the client has the bacteria present but hasn't become infective. infected. When you see that word colonization, that means that there's a certain bacteria that is present but it's not causing harm, okay? I wanna give you guys an example. We all, as human beings, we all carry staph on our skin. We walk around with it every day, right? But if we're healthy individuals, and we get a cut, it doesn't harm us, right? But if a patient's immunocompromised or they're elderly or their immune system's down, that same staff that they carry around on their skin, if they get a cut and that same staff gets into that cut and turns into MRSA, turns into a horrible infection, right? That's what colonization means. So we walk around with staff all the time, but it's not causing us harm. Another example, um, elderly patients in the nursing home, many of them tend to be colonized in the bladder. That means if you take a random uh, resident in a nursing home and you do a urine culture on their urine, you'll see all this bacteria in their urine, right? But you shouldn't freak out because if they're asymptomatic, which means they're not exhibiting any symptoms of an infection, they have colonization and most um, um, nursing home residents do have colonization. They have this bacteria that's in the in their bladder, but it's not causing any harm. That's why patients in uh, nursing homes are not routinely tested. Their urine is not routinely tested. We don't run UAs on them unless they're exhibiting signs and symptoms of infection. Because if you take any patient and you test their urine in a nursing home, you're going to see bacteria. So what are you going to do? Just have the doctor medicate every single patient in the nursing home for no reason? No, they're colonized. They have that bacteria, but it's not causing them any harm. Okay. So that's what that word colonization means. If you see it next time, you'll be able to recognize it. The nurse knows that staph aureus found normally on the skin of a client who had surgery poses a particular risk for the client developing one, a cold sore, two, a gastroenteritis, three, a wound infection, four, a urinary tract infection. And guys, I just gave you the answer to this, okay? So the correct answer is three, a wound infection. We all carry staph on our skin right? It's not harmful until we have an opening in our skin and that staph get, gets in. And if we happen to be immunocompromised, we happen to be weak, it might turn into an infection, okay? A client enters a neighborhood walk-in clinic reporting the symptoms of a head cold. When the healthcare provider does not prescribe an antibiotic, the client asks the nurse to explain why not. The nurse's most appropriate response is, to, is one, Antibiotics aren't usually necessary for colds and they're really very expensive if you don't have insurance. Two, you know what they say, a cold will go away with medication in two weeks without medication 14 days. Three, your healthcare provider believes in treating the symptoms since there are so many different strains of the common cold. Four, Common colds don't usually require an antibiotic and taking one results in making it harder to treat infections when they do occur. And the correct answer is four. Okay guys, so the cold, that's a virus. We don't give antibiotics for viral infections because antibiotics do nothing for viruses. So when a patient takes an antibiotic, when they have a viral infection, the only thing that they're doing is causing their body to be resistant to that antibiotic. So the next time they're sick with a bacterial infection and they need an antibiotic, that antibiotic will not work on them because they've built up a resistance, okay? So you need to know this. Never, ever, ever 
give an antibiotic for a viral infection. So if you get a question and in the question, the patient has a viral infection and the doctor ordered an antibiotic, are you going to give it? No, you're going to question that order. You're going to call up the physician and say, hey, I noticed the patient was diagnosed with this viral infection and you wanted me to give an antibiotic and you get clarification, okay? Never give an antibiotic for viral infection. Which of the following clients is at greatest risk for acquiring a healthcare associated infection, also known as a nosocomial infection? One, 32 year old hospitalized for two days for migraine headache. Two, client with type one diabetes experiencing hypoglycemia. Three, trauma victim taken directly from the emergency department to surgery and then to the post-surgical unit. Four, pregnant woman, 24 years, diagnosed with both sinusitis and otitis media and prescribed an oral antibiotic. Guys, and your correct answer is three. If you recall, I said to you, anything that's invasive is high, high, high risk for infection. Anything invasive, what, is, what, do, what do I mean when I say invasive? Going into the body. An injection, surgery where the doctor has to cut into the patient, right? Um, um, a catheter, anything that is inserted into any orifice of the body or any time the body has to be cut into such a surgery carries a high risk of infection. Okay, so the correct answer is three, the patient who had to go into surgery and then they came out into the post-surgical um, unit. A client admitted for treatment of various poorly healing infected leg ulcers. The nurse recognizes that the client's nutritional history is of primary importance since one, nutrition is vital to the client's overall health status. Two, client's food intake will likely be decreased as a result of the illness. Three, wound healing and infection prevention are negatively impacted by poor nutrition. Four, the client's habits regarding food intake are directly related to this hospitalization. And the correct answer is three, wound healing and infection prevention are negatively impacted by poor nutrition. Absolutely. When a patient has an infection, this is when we want to increase their vitamin C. Why? Vitamin C helps fight off infection, right? Increase it, 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 it builds up your immune system. When a patient has infection, we want to increase their protein. Why? Protein helps with healing, specifically wound healing. Because so um, uh, patient's nutrition plays a vital role in, um, healing, wound healing, and that patient just getting uh, overall uh, better. Nutrition is very important. Lots of fluids, lots of vitamin C, protein. And we're down to our last question. The nurse is providing care for a client who postoperatively has developed an infected incisional wound and is depressed and anorexic. Which of the following nursing intervention has priority? One, sterile wound care. Two, frequent small meals. Three, administration of antidepressant medication. Four, educating the client regarding wound care at home. And the correct answer is one, sterile wound care. Why? Uh, this patient already has an infection and we're trying to get um, that infection cleared up. So we have to do sterile wound care. Every time we're changing the dressing, it has to be sterile so we don't introduce pathogens and bacteria into that wound. That's gonna take priority over everything else, over small frequent meals, because who cares about small frequent meals if the patient's now septic? Administration of antidepressant medication, that, you know, that's wonderful, but that has nothing to do with that wound that that patient has right now that we're trying to get healed. And the last choice, educating the patient. Guys, if you have not watched my priorities video, please watch it. I explained to you what is a priority in a given situation and patient education is important. Yes, but when it comes to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right, wound care, is down here because that's most important. That's our base, right? Physiological integrity and education is all the way up there towards the top.
okay? Because who cares about educating the patient if they're dying on us, okay? So yes, education is important, but it's not gonna take place over physiologic integrity, which is that wound care, all right? So if you guys are having a little issue with priority, be sure to watch my priority uh, video. I hope that you guys found uh, these questions and rationales helpful. Please do not forget, if you have not done so already, to press that like and subscribe button below to keep the videos and the content coming. Thank you. Bye-bye.